Hi there, I'm Barry Habib. I'm the CEO of MBS Highway. I'm a professional speaker. been doing that for more years than I want to admit to. In addition to that, I was blessed enough to write a best-selling book on Amazon, number one bestseller, called Money in the Streets. A lot of inspiration behind that. I've been around the mortgage industry and real estate industry for quite a few years now. I've had a few companies that I've built. They've become very successful, and I've sold. Now, my current company, my current business in that arena is called MBS Highway, and we help many mortgage professionals and real estate agents understand the financial markets and show the opportunity in real estate and also help them to evaluate that. Also do some fun things too. I actually sing in a band called Rock of Ages and that was inspired by being the lead producer of the show Rock of Ages, the 27th longest running show in Broadway history, but it's been around the globe. We'll talk about that a little bit. I've actually done some acting too. Been in nine movies, some of them kind of fun, had some fun roles doing that. And in general, just enjoy life and enjoy helping others. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan Bauman Perks. Welcome to the series. Thank you very much indeed, Barry. And it was Brian J. Esposito, who's a mutual friend of ours, who very kindly... Love him. I love him. Yeah, we, we, how can you not? The guy is so special, so very generous. And uh, he said, the guy you got to have on is Barry. And so before I had you on, I went and listened to your audio book. And boy, I loved it, Money in the Streets. I found uh, of the 200 I've listened to in the last three years, it's one of my top 10 favorites. And I think what I loved about it, Barry, was firstly, you read it yourself. You've got a great resonant voice and you, you know, obviously you're a motivational speaker around the world, but it just came across very authentically, the sort of the tough upbringing in New York and then all the experiences you've had and then gonna go and see, which I went to see Rock of Ages, really enjoyed that you know, the producing side, the real estate, the mortgages, all the experience you've done. But yet in the middle of it, there was a lot of humility as well. The, it wasn't the big I am. This wasn't a, a trumpeting from the, from the top of the building. Look how great I am. You also went, look, I made some mistakes and I had some tough times. So that's why you're on the Inspiring Leadership Series and it's great to have you here. Tell us a bit more about what you're doing right now. There's, there's so much going on. Well, it is a privilege to be on the series with you. So I appreciate that. And thank you for those of you that are listening. It's, uh, it's really an honor to uh, have you give me one of the most important things you can give, and that's your attention. Uh, with respect to what I'm doing right now, Jonathan, there's, there's always a lot of balls in the air. You know, I, I, uh, I am continuing to be speaking around the country, and that's very rewarding. A little tiring at times, but it's really, really rewarding. Uh, in addition to that, I have a business that I'm running called MBS Highway. It's really thriving. And uh, we are the prominent resource for real estate data, financial data with regards to interest rates in the mortgage arena. So uh, that's been an incredible ride for me. And then in addition to that, I'm still active on the entertainment side. You know, I, I think that uh, it's good to work both sides of your brain. And uh, I have uh, Chris Angel's show in Las Vegas that I produced, and that's been wonderful. It's doing extremely well. Just opened Whitney Houston. I know that Whitney's not with us, but the hologram is. And what we're doing is we've got a hologram show that people really are enjoying the music and kind of seeing her um, brought back to life a little bit there. It's been a lot of fun to just open that. In addition to that, I am bringing back Rock of Ages, but this time to Las Vegas in a little bit of a different way in an immersive theater format. So we hope to open that in the spring. As you can imagine, there's a lot of moving parts to putting that together. So uh, keeping busy. <laughs> Gosh, you are. Wow, I'm exhausted just listening to that, all the things you're doing. And and as, as a motivational speaker, I mean, you know, you're great, you're great friends with Tony Robbins. And uh, I, I've seen a number of videos where he's been very complimentary of you. What would be a sort of top tip about being a top end motivational speaker? How did you get there? What was what was the success of that? Well, you know, Tony is a really special human being. And I cherish that uh, I'm, I'm able to call him a good friend. Uh, being a speaker is no different than any other profession. You, know, you, you really need to continuously practice and work on it. So you don't come out of the womb and just all of a sudden start doing something successfully. So part of that is being brave enough to take the chance and believe in yourself. That's a hard thing to do. It's easy to say, it's pretty hard to do because you have to understand that you're going to suck in the beginning. So um, what you want to try and do is you want to just try and know that in anything you do, you have to go through a period of not being very good at it. 
and deal with that because the only way you get good is to first not be good. I mean, just think about that for a second. You know, nobody's, you know, instant. Well, maybe some people are just these naturals, but you know, that wasn't me. I was, and I don't think that applies to most of us. So what we really need to do is get it through our mind that it's okay to suck if we learn from it and then go back at it again. So if we really want to get good, first get your mind around the fact that you're not going to be very good initially, but over time with repetition, with practice, and it's not time in hours, it's more time and repetition that uh, you have to be able to deal with and cope with that ability to get your brain to reconcile that it's okay for me to not be the very best I am. The fact of it is you're never going to be the very best Jim because you always want to try and continuously get better. Yeah, no, that's such profound wisdom. Thank you for that. And, and in, in your book, which I do recommend people read if that's what they like doing or listen to. And, and I, I think the, the listening is the, is the version I've enjoyed the most because we get the added benefit of your voice and not some rather ham actor trying to read out someone else's story. It's you telling your own story. Um, take us back to perhaps over 10, 15 minutes, a, a, a taste of your life and the kind of people who influenced you, the experiences that influenced you to be the successful all-rounder that you are with so, so many fingers and so many different pies. Just take us through a bit of your life story. Well, you know, I consider myself more of a student and, and continuous work in progress. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's still have a, lo a lot of things I'd like to do. And starting off, um, I was kind of fortunate, Jonathan, in that um, my parents were extremely poor. They come from Europe, they come to the US and here they are there. Uh, they've got six suitcases, um, struggling, other children to take care of. And then at the age of 57, and my, was my dad and my mom's 40, they find out, hey, pregnant with, uh, with a baby. Now, how lucky am I that I was conceived right before birth control was put out there and born right before abortion was legalized. <laughs> so kind of snuck in there. And that obviously was an opportunity that I want to make the most of. So um, my dad passed away when I was very young. My mom, I mean, two amazing people and my mom, just a, an incredible woman. So it was very hard for her because as a young girl, she had to be taken out of school. Her mother became very ill, my grandma, which I never met any of my grandparents and um, had to be taken out of school and take care of the household with only a third grade education. So she really never learned how to read and write, but she was an incredibly bright woman. She spoke seven languages fluently. Imagine being able to do that with reading and writing skills, but without it, you pretty much have to have some good, good mental capacity there. So she was an extraordinary lady and worked very, very hard. And the sacrifices that my parents made to give me opportunity are something that I always want to honor because I don't want to ever waste that. So I want to do the most I can with that. So growing up was, was a bit of a challenge, you know, not um, being very poor, um, being made fun of because your clothes were hand-me-downs and certainly not having toys. And, you know, but, but that was a good thing because that kind of, I think, exercised a part of our brain we all have, and that's creativity. So at a very young age, I had to create and invent because I didn't have means to buy. So I, I think that exercising that part of my brain very young did actually wind up to be a benefit as I got older. And that's the same with, with all aspects of life. You know, uh, disadvantages can eventually become advantages if you let them. So if you look at it as a disadvantage, that's one thing. But if you try to adapt to it, which, which I, I, I didn't know that I was adapting to it, I just wanted to be happy as a kid. So um, I, I was never a complainer. I just wanted to make the best of things. And creating and inventing games and, 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 you know, playing games with, you know, uh, just, just items that were around the house that allowed me to foster that creativity. And I think that really helped out uh, later in life because I, I had been able to be a little bit more resourceful, I think, than if I were just given everything. Um, so I, I was a little careful with that with my own children. Um, it's a fine balance. You want to spoil them, but uh, you also want to try and get them to foster that creativity. Yeah, and, and you've triggered with me two thoughts. One was uh, when I was in Nepal uh, on an expedition in my army days, uh, I was the guy who was the medic. In other words, I'd had two days of training in medical things, but people came from three days walk away with injuries to see the doctor 
that they'd heard about. And they were outside my tent in the morning. But while I was trying to treat them with what I had, I had to explain that I couldn't give them, you know, all the antibiotics I had and that kind of stuff, just help where I could. But they had little kids playing and the kids had no toys. They, they had a, a metal hoop um, that, that, you know, they were playing with that in the dirt or they, a rock, or two rocks together. And they were massively happy just doing very simple things. They didn't need um, very much. And the other thing you really um, resonated for me was um, when I was at school, uh, my mother brought three boys up on her own as, as well. I mean, you had a bigger family, but my dad was killed when I was two and a half, a fast jet pilot in the Navy. And so we were living in a caravan and then we had to, we had to move out. We weren't guests of the Navy anymore. But I remember at school, I was called Stone Age Perks because they thought my clothes had come from the Stone Age because they were handed down from so many people. But uh, that, that just resonated when I heard your story then and also when I was listening to your book. Sorry, Barry, please carry oh, on. Don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. What a, what a wonderful story. I'm so, so wonderful of you to want to give back and do the things that you were doing, Jonathan. And uh, yeah, I could see we're kindred spirits that way. And so many people have stories like this. You know, my mom worked in a sweatshop where they make dresses. And I remember as a little kid kind of going to visit and, and it was hard. So um, that really did shape me quite a bit and wanting something better. You know, I was always optimistic. You know, I, I, I think that many of us who are dealt some unfortunate circumstance and we all, are, I mean, the, the thing we all have in common is we all do suffer and we all will suffer, right? It's no matter what you have, no matter what you've accomplished, we're all gonna be in that position at some point in time uh, if we're not going through something already. So it's your mindset really that can take you out of that. Or if you believe that there's something better, if you believe that um, there will be something better and that you can work your way towards something better, that's very transformational. So these are all things that I think are very, very important that were part of my upbringing. I was always an optimistic kid. And I think that that's a common thread among success is mm -hmm. optimism, mm -hmm. believing that, that you can. Um, and then of course, not just believing it, but moving towards it step-by-step, step, slowly but surely every day, getting a plan, mapping it out and getting there, reverse engineer that. So these are all things, uh, Jonathan, that, that did help. And then you know, building on some, some successes that occurred, you know, so uh, I, I was a, I was a fidgety kid. So, you know, sc school was something that um, in ways it came very easy because I had a high aptitude, but I never really learned how to study because I kind of just was able to memorize things and figure stuff out. Um, so when I went to college, it was a rude awakening. Like, wait, wait a second, you didn't cover this in class. Oh no, you're supposed to learn on your own. Well, how do I do that? <laughs> so I had to figure that out kind of quickly. Um, but I actually did not complete college. I went for three years and then uh, found that, um, being out in the real world and working was very exciting. I thought I'd always go back. I did not wind up going back for my last year of college. Um, I, I started doing some fun things uh, as a young guy. I started selling stereo equipment out of the trunk of my car and then got all my friends involved, started a business doing that and then switched to um, from there to, to real estate because I noticed that uh, some of the money I was making, I could invest it in real estate. And then as I was taking some properties and either fixing them up or taking those properties and renting them out, and this was in my early 20s, I needed mortgages. And from there, went into the mortgage business. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the experiences that we gain from just communicating with people is incredible. You know, so learning how to sell out of the trunk of my car in different neighborhoods or to strangers and, and, and understanding really what people want and understanding the importance and the value of trust. One of the biggest lessons, Jonathan, for me is that when things go wrong, that could be your best friend. So uh, I, I, electronics sometimes go wrong. And as they did, you know, I was this kid that sold you a stereo from the trunk of my car. Uh, when people actually called me and actually went back and replaced it or fixed it or whatever it took to make it right by them, and they thought they'd never see me again, that changed the whole relationship. If they just bought a stereo and it worked fine, they said, oh, I got a good deal. But that was transformational now because instead of making it a sale, I made it a relationship. They almost felt obligated to tell everyone else and wanting to even buy more because here I was, they saw my character. And sometimes it takes something to go wrong for you to have an opportunity to show your character. 
And that will change everything in the relationship. We've been on both sides of that. You know? So when we, when we have an obstacle in front of us, it's really important how we look at that obstacle. Yeah, I, I, I so love that. And I'm a great follower of Stoic philosopher, uh, philosophy with Epictetus and Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. And one of their uh, whole approaches, it's not the fact you have a problem, it's how you handle the problem that marks you out from the very average to, to become extraordinary. Uh, you're still ordinary, but just you, you've got that extra bit. No, I, I really agree with that. And so, Barry, what about in your life, and you've done so many things, what would be one of your proudest moments and what did you learn from that moment? And what would have been one of your toughest moments in your life, either personally or, or work or both? And, and what you learned from that? Well, um, I'm blessed with four wonderful children and now two grandchildren. Wow. And seeing the, the quality of human beings that my children have turned out to be and, and the love that they have for me, you know, and the closeness that we have, that's one of my proudest moments that I get to experience every day. Mm. Um, having a great business and building it and having people really respect and, and appreciate the help that I've given, that's, that's an incredible blessing. Um, some, of the, some of the recognition that I've received, you know, winning three crystal ball awards for being the most accurate real estate forecaster in the country, in the United States, that's been, that's been a real, real proud moment and achievement for me. So, you know, there's been a lot of good fortune and blessings that God's given me that I've been able to, uh, I've been able to, to really reflect upon and, and be grateful for. Um, there's been a lot of low points too. You know, there's been a lot of mistakes, a lot of missteps. Uh, I've been divorced twice, um, bit of a workaholic. Um, uh, as I said, I'm a work in progress and someone who always has to learn. So learning a little bit more life balance skills I've been trying to do to some extent, I've had some success there, but um, there's been a lot of mistakes. Uh, just, just the way that um, I've allowed emotion to get in a way of interaction. Mm. Um, you know, we all have those moments, right? Where, you know, you're short, you say things that you that you wish you wouldn't have said, you know. Um, but I try and learn from them and improve upon them. And, and yeah. uh, I've also tried to learn to um, make sure that I apologize and try mm -hmm. and make things right. That's a, that's a really big, that's a really big thing because we're going to make mistakes, right? So um, yeah. understanding to own those mistakes, it takes a lot to do it because it really doesn't feel very good. Mm. Um, but taking ownership of those mistakes and then trying to atone for them, yeah, I think yeah. I think makes you a happier person. Uh, it, so right, and, and Barry, thank you for sharing that because they're, they're painful moments. And having been through a divorce myself um, some eight years ago, uh, after twenty three years of marriage, and now I'm remarried, um, but very very happily now I've now found my soulmate, my my life partner. Um, but it just it doesn't take away the pain for the children. Uh, we've got my wife and I have now got four children, two each, and we've got a grandchild, another grandchild on the way. So I relate to what you do. But I think it is a common story of the other successful leaders on the Inspiring Leadership Series that, that many of them uh, live by the motto that anything in life is possible if you're prepared to pay the price and live with the consequences. And, and often these very inspiring leaders are very driven and often workaholics and and there are consequences and there are prices to pay of some of the successes that come with it um and and yeah it's just it's just one of those things knowing what you know now barry and looking back to the young barry habib if you met yourself age 16 with all the wisdom you've got now as a father of four and a grandfather of two what what would you say this matters and that doesn't matter? What would be your bit of wisdom? Well, I'd, I'd try and let more of the little things go, mm. you know, where, you know, it, just, just let it be. I try and do that now where uh, being happy is a lot better than being right. That doesn't mean you, you sacrifice your principles. Okay. There are things that you need to 
have the wisdom to be able to decide what's worth being right about and what's worth being happy about. And I think as a younger person, you know, who uh, you know, was proud and, you know, was trying to make a name for myself, you know, maybe being right was, was more important than it should have been. And there could have been times where being gracious would have been the better route to take. Um, again, I think I could have gotten the same place even quicker or, or, or better. Um, and, and also trying to be less insecure. You know, we all have insecurities and I'm by far and away no exception to that. So those insecurities, they, they cause us to want to say things or do things to prove our own worth. And I think that there's some balance that needs to take place there. And as a younger person, um, and even as an older person, you know, I didn't always have that balance at the right spot. But mm -hmm. I've learned that I've learned that to gain appreciation of others um, is an important step, and to um, and to try and have a level of humility uh, makes you feel better about yourself. You know? Yeah, so, yeah, very, very true, and it has triggered two thoughts. One is. Um, uh, that lovely story i can't remember who it came from i think it was about a it was a conductor and um of an orchestra he like, runs a, a, a amazing written an amazing book about performance and uh it was a prime minister of a country and had one of his ministers with him and he was uh talking and the lady came rushing in she said prime minister this has all gone wrong and he goes mary remember rule number six and she goes oh yes yeah, sorry prime minister uh, it, all is going to be fine don't worry and she leaves and then he's chatting to this minister and then someone else rushes in oh, prime minister this is this is all this is all terrible and he said jeff remember rule number six. Oh, oh yes yes prime minister sorry uh, everything's fine and he goes what's rule number six and he goes don't take yourself too damn seriously and he goes what are the other rules <laughs> because there are no other rules. <laughs> and, and I think looking back on my life, I took myself so damn seriously. And I was trying to prove, I was told by my teacher when I was seven, I was thick and I was going to become a dustman cleaning the, you know, all the, the refuge carts because I couldn't spell, I couldn't do my maths. Now, it turned out I was dyslexic or what they now even label neurodiverse, that I was dyslexic and dyscalculia. I couldn't do the numbers. So I would have been terrible in guessing the, uh, the interest rates and mortgages. Barry, you've got the great, the great math skills. I, I have definitely not. Though I did pure and applied maths and I'm a visiting professor at a business school, but I still can't do my numbers. But it made me constantly trying to prove myself to people. And, and just like, don't take yourself too damn seriously. Oh, God, if yeah, only, Jonathan, if only I, I learned that. Yeah, I agree. And don't worry about the math skills, Jonathan. They have calculators <laughs> that'll help with that right now. That'll do great, just fine. So what it's done is it's it's allowed you to sharpen some of your under other wonderful skills, right? So you so nurture other skills, which which that's the thing. If we have something that's a bit of an obstacle, maybe there's there's other things that we can nourish or focus that we wouldn't have had the time for. So yeah, so it, it could be a positive for you. But by the way, when when it comes to like you said some young people that are told something, you know, if it's told to a young person in a way that could be a negative, it could cause insecurity, but if it's told in a nurturing way, it could be inspiring. So we always have to be careful what we tell people who we can influence and how we handle those that we have influence over because we want to nurture and inspire. We don't want to coddle, you know, no, because the world no. is a very perilous place. Yeah. So we don't want to give them a false expectation of the world because that would not be in their best interest. But we do want to try uh, to the best degree that we can, nobody's perfect, to be inspiring. And yeah. you don't have to be a motivational speaker. We can all try and point to inspiration as opposed to causing an insecurity. Yeah, well, in your, in your excellent book, Money in the Streets, um, you did talk about the influence of your mother and um, clearly looking after you all with your father sadly dying. And, and with my mother, it was the same. She was almost acting as the two people. And, and when I was, I came back crestfallen, having been told I was going to be a dustman because I couldn't spell and couldn't do my English. She said, don't worry, darling. She said, we'll find other ways. There's other intelligences. We'll find other things that you'll be good at. 
And uh, the only problem was she was convinced that since she couldn't be an admiral's wife, because my father was a, on his way to become a, an admiral in the Navy, since she couldn't be that, that I, her son, her youngest son, was going to be the solution to all her problems by becoming a general in the army. So she'd say things like, Jonathan, generals don't yawn. And I still yawn to this day at age 60. Um, but uh, I sadly only became a major, never a general. But uh, she still forgave me because she thought I'd achieved an awful lot in my life uh, before she, she, she passed away. Um, we're going to go around the Inspiring Leadership Compass just as a general framework for a chat, Barry, because it gives a chance uh, for you to share some of your amazing wisdom. The first one is that, that what we call the true north, the, uh, the moral quotient, the, um, the, the thing that doesn't change. Well, magnetic north changes, but true north doesn't. What are two or three of your foundational principles and values you live by, which, as you say, you, you, you haven't sacrificed them? They've been important to you when you've had to make other sacrifices, but not your principles. You don't break promises. Mm. So that's you keeping your word. You know, and and I, I think that that's been that's really served me well, because um, relationships business wise i think people know me that if i say i will do something i will do it mm -hmm. and they don't need elaborate contracts they need this it's a, there's and that leads to to trust you know which which if, if you don't break a promise then you're going to build a lot more trust and you gain trust not by all the positives you gain trust by pointing out the negatives you gain trust by being vulnerable um, and I think that that these are these are important things: is to be be vulnerable, be be trustworthy, don't break your promises, um, and and do the right thing even when it's hard. You know, do the right thing when nobody's looking. You know, and and also don't just do the right thing, but be excellent when you don't have to be excellent. Yeah. You know, the, don't a shortcut that doesn't compromise is okay, but we use the word term shortcut sometimes in a negative sense. And that's what I mean here. A shortcut that compromises quality um, is, is not a road you wanna take. You, you, you don't want to be that person. You, you want to exemplify excellence, quality, making sure that you, you're proud of whatever it is that you do, even if you're the only one who sees it. Yeah, yeah, and I, I love the story of um, uh, Steve Jobs' father, who was a cabinet maker, and, and he used to ensure that the back of the cabinet was as beautiful as the front, but he said, but people won't see that. Yeah, but I know what it's like at the back, and that's why the inside of the, the watches and things, Jobs was so fanatical about it. But I, I think you've raised a really important point for me, this, this thing about vulnerability, and that it's one of the lovely things about the people on the Inspiring Leadership series. They... They all have a humility and a humanity about a, a, a vulnerability. But too often, sadly, with leaders in, in my country, the UK, and certainly I see in America, that there's very, very few will actually say, Look, I'm sorry, I got it wrong, or I made a mistake and I apologize. And you, you were talking about that. Say a bit more about vulnerability and, and why well, do you, you think know, you they won't do that? Saying you got it wrong. So so we have a really good track record on our forecasts. And then every day we have to make decisions as far as what you should do for interest rates. Nobody's perfect. We've gotten it wrong. But when we get it wrong, it's like one of the first things I say, and you know, to get on camera to all of your paying subscribers and say, look, we're sorry, we got this wrong. What's amazing is we get more emails we get a lot of really lovely lovely emails and you know we don't have we don't have clients we have their friends their relationships they're uh, they're so supportive it's at those times we'll literally get hundreds of our subscribers that will say the nicest most wonderful things it, it gets me emotional now just thinking about, mm -hmm. you know, how supportive people are you know, when they see that, you know, you're, you're not trying to hide it. You're owning it. You're taking, you know, it's, it's amazing how, how it restores your belief in the goodness of the world. When, when you are like that and you see how people come to your support and say, you know, you've been so great. We got your back. Don't worry. You know, it's like, just, just all, you know, all these wonderful things. And that wouldn't happen 
unless we allowed ourselves to be vulnerable and own our mistakes and say we're sorry. Yeah, no, I think very profound. Thank and you. It's the same, and, it's, and it's the same in relationships. Yeah, oh, definitely in relationships, I think. You know, the person that you love most, I mean, that's the person that you want to know that, you know, that it means something to you, right? Yeah, and that's often the person that we accidentally hurt the most because they're closest to us. Um, and as you say, once we've said something, we can't unsay it. Um, and I think um, my mouth has occasionally run away with itself. And, and I, I need to learn to be a little bit more thoughtful and reflective. Is, is what I'm about to say helpful at this time and in this way to this person? Yeah, but in the real world, Jonathan, that's awfully hard to do. I, I make uh, that mistake a lot. It's very, very hard to do. You try, yeah. but you know, we're emotional creatures and it does get the best of us sometimes. We do have to just do the best we can to take a deep breath when we can. Um, and then if we do make a misstep, we just got to try and, and, and stop it as soon as possible. What happens is we start believing that story to ourselves mm. and we want to justify to ourselves while we're right. So we make it worse by continuing along that path instead of saying, hey, hold on a second. This is a person, this is a relationship that I care about. There's a lot of good that's, that they've done for me. They, this, this, you know, I know that maybe I'm upset with them about this one thing, but how about all the other things? And let me just try and get some, some kind of metaphorical scale out here just to say that this, this one thing compared to all the others, and you know, maybe there could be a little grace here that yeah. um, I, th I think that's an important thing for us to do. Yeah, no, so, so true, so true. And then going on around the, the second point of the compass is purpose and meaning. What gives your life meaning and purpose? People call it, you know, your dharma, your calling, your vocation. Barry, what, why do you do what you do and why have you done what you've done? Well, there's a lot, of, a lot of reasons, you know. Certainly financial gain is something I'm not afraid to admit. I was grew up really, really poor and while, you know, doesn't solve all your problems. It does make life a little easier, but it also allows you to do a lot of good with that. You know, you can do a lot of good in the world by having the means to do that good and make other people happier. Um, you know, but it's not just financial because when you have financial success, doesn't necessarily make you happy. Uh, achievement goals and goal setting does continue to give you purpose and drive. And that's really important in achieving those goals gives you confidence that you can overcome obstacles. These are really important things in life. So they're not individual, they're more legs of a stool. And if you'd say, okay, we definitely want financial goals. We want financial success. There's nothing to be shameful for that. We definitely want achievement success. We want recognition. We want to be able to overcome obstacles and reach for things and plan for things and successfully attain them. There's nothing wrong with that. That's great because that's such a building block and it's it, it's it's an amazing thing to do and it also gives you a sense of of satisfaction there but people who've attained those two might oftentimes be missing the third leg of the stool and the result is that they're not necessarily happy and we look at those people and we say well why are they happy they seem to have everything right and i think that fulfillment is what might be missing and that's a tough one you know but because it could be a little different but for most of us fulfillment is doing good for others and by doing good for others you know they they do really love you and they don't love you because what you have they love you because you care you know mm -hmm. and they they know that you you genuinely care and you uh, prioritize that relationship you do the right thing in that relationship you um you, you really want to help others and you, you, you want to do good in the world. You know, that's, that's such an important thing. And if you know that you're doing good in the world and it's coming back to, you know, you're on the right path, that gives you a sense of fulfillment. And I think if you have a bit of all those three, that you're happier, you know, look, happiness is, that's elusive. Okay. That's, you know, we're all going to suffer. As I said, we're all going to have obstacles. Things are going to come up to piss us off. You're going to get angry. We are. We're human. Okay. But in general, to have peace of mind, to, to be happier, um, to, to have a good feeling about yourself, you know, that, that's what you should strive for.
Mm. You, you want to feel good about yourself. You want to feel like I'm making a positive influence on individuals, doing good in the world. Mm. You don't have to do it all in one shot. You, know, you just you start slowly. And you know, if you look at somebody and they've achieved some success, and you know, don't pine about I should have done that. I should have invested in that. I should have done this. But you know, the best plan, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time is today. Mm. No, very, very true. And and with all that you've done. Uh, health quotient is the third area, mental health and physical health. You know, you talked about uh, being a workaholic, and I relate to that. And and you've had all these things that have been going on and juggling many things. What tip would you give to look after your mental health and your physical health that's worked for you? So, you know, listen, I, I don't think excessive drinking is smart. I think I, I have, I enjoy a little bit of wine here. I'll have a cocktail here, but, but I don't excessively drink. I don't remember the last time I actually got intoxicated. I don't remember that, you know, like, like, look, a little buzz, you know, it's fine. You know, uh, I don't think that dabbling with or experimenting with a lot of drugs is a very good idea. I don't think so either, you know, so um, I think that those are really important. I think exercise is important, whether it's, you know, walking or working out, I, you know, I, I try my best to work out as often as I can. Sometimes travel doesn't allow for that. But when I'm home, I'm, I'm typically really good. I'll get a workout in almost every day. Um, and so the combination of those things are important. And then, you know, the obvious is trying to eat, right? Listen, I, I love, <laughs> I love, I love sweets. I love good food. I love, you know, I love all this stuff. Um and, uh, you know, I struggle with it, just like everybody else. I'm human. Just because you're a speaker doesn't mean, you know, you don't, don't want to eat ice cream, because I do. Um, so uh, doing the best I can to have some sort of balance there. I'm not always successful. I'm probably more, <laughs> more vulnerable there than successful. Um, but, but I try and at least make up for it by making sure I work out and making sure I don't, I, I don't do all the things that are a bit taboo you know i'm not going to neglect workouts and drink a lot and eat really bad you know i'm not going to do all those things so if i'm mm -hmm. going to eat a little bit bad let me just make sure i kind of work out and stay on on path with not doing other things that are you know so what i'm trying to say is something we've all been taught it works and that's moderation to some degree so. yeah yeah well it, it's interesting you say that um one of the other guests who's going to be on um, shortly is Sharon Peacock, CBE, who's the government's chief microbiologist, and she runs the, the, the COVID team of about 600 in a thing called COG UK, uh, working out what the next virus variant is. And as you know, we've got another one coming. Oh, it's just arrived in this country with about seven cases. Um, and, and she was talking about the microbiome, the gut microbiome. And uh, I'm reading this fast, just finished reading this fascinating book called 10% Human that 90% of you is microbes. It's not even you. It's just like something else that's in your body. And they did lots of experiments on um, changing the gut microbiota between different rats and things, between fat rats and thin rats. And by changing the microbiota between the two, they changed the rats. And so there's much to be said by what's in there, the, what, in the, how we look after it and feed those microbes. Yeah, uh, I'm, 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 a big, I'm a big student of all that, Jonathan, huge. I'm, I'm blessed that the... One of the heads of the Cleveland Clinic, uh, Mike Roizen, and I are dear friends. He lectures wow. about longevity, and I've learned so much from him. So I'm I'm an addict with this stuff, you know, of learning about this. I'm a lifelong learner. I actually had an, a healthcare imaging business that uh, that I had. We opened up three centers, and I built that business and sold it. So I've always loved this kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's the other aspect of it is you know making sure you check you check your levels on things that you you stay on top of that, that you don't neglect that aspect of it. Cause if something goes wrong and things go wrong, that you try and nip it in the bud, but yeah, being in kind of a starvation mode. And I think that interim fasting could be very beneficial because that teaches your body. You actually live longer. And, you know, if your blood sugar levels high, try and get on metformin because that's been proven to extend longevity. So these are, there's little things that you can speak to your healthcare specialist to yeah. Talk to about it. Don't just go there because there's something wrong. Go there to be proactive because you want to live longer, but you don't want to just live in years. You want to live in health. So these are things that uh, that that I think if we take it, you know, just take it like as a business plan. You know, you yeah. build your business. You got to build it out as a CEO. That's what I want to do in my businesses. But as the CEO of my own health, which we all are, I like to stay on top of this. And what can I do? to ensure that aside from the obvious, what kind of tips can I get? If you're not getting it from your healthcare professional, get it from another one, get it from some, you know, the, the, get the smartest 
and the brightest to be your teammate. Yeah, no, it, it's it's so true. Having your health span match your lifespan uh, is really what I aspire to. And uh, I was very ill recently for about seven weeks, um, mm -hmm. all to do with sort of urology, which I won't go into, but it really knocked me sideways. And, and, and it made me realize um, how fragile we are. My brother, David, who was only 63, died a couple of months ago of a, a very short uh, notice cancer, which just got throughout the whole of his body. And you just sort of realize that you don't know when your number's up. My dad was 33 when he was killed. His brother was 29 when he was killed. And um, so I think doing what we can for our health so we, we can live a good life uh, but also be prepared for a good death, as the, as the Stoics would say, because it's going to come to us all. It's the only certainty in life once we're born is that we will die. Um, well, another, another thing about that is try and laugh every day, right? And yeah. you go back to rule number six. <laughs> so, um, you, know, you, really need to, you really need to laugh every day and you need to see the good. Yeah. You know, pe people will see what they look for. Yeah. If you look, if you look for pettiness, if you look for something to knock, you know, you'll definitely see that. But if you look for good, you know, as you know, I always tell people, especially, you know, in, in relationships and the, if they're in sales or whatever they do, you know, if you want to be more magnetic, you know, everybody wants to be more magnetic. You see a person it's like, wow, you know, so what's magnetism, the desire to want to be around them more, right? So magnetic people, how do you, well, it's a pretty easy secret. So here it is. Everyone you come into contact with, make them feel better and get over your own insecurity, get over your own grudges, your own, uh, you know, begrudging desire to compliment them. If you look around and you look for certain things, like I always say with my presentation, it's okay, look around the room. And everybody look around the room. I say, okay, now look around, but this time look for an Alberta color, a blue or a red or a green. And everybody starts count how many in about you know 30 seconds, they'll, they'll count it. I said, didn't those colors just pop out at you? Isn't it true that when you buy a new car, you see all the cars like that pop out at you on the road? You, know, you will see what you're looking for. If you meet someone and you're looking for good, you'll see good. And if you get over your own insecurity, then if you could point those things out, then you'll make them feel better. And the other thing is to make them feel smarter. Now, how do we do that? We do that by constantly learning ourselves. Don't consume to consume, consume to teach. So when you learn knowledge, consume that knowledge to teach, to be of assistance to others, not to point out negativities or to be pointing out things in, in a way that's demeaning, but enhance mm. do that. If you can come into contact with people and help them feel smarter and help them feel better, well, I promise you they'll want more of that, which is the definition of being magnetic. Yeah. Oh, that really resonates for me. And I think in my work as a, a, a trusted leadership coach and mentor to CEOs and top teams and boards, I'm learning all the stuff from you and from others. Um, I just do this to pay it forward. I don't make any money from it, but I, it allows me to learn things that I can then teach others. I'll, I'll, I take from what you say and it's to pass it on down. As, as one of the actors said, remember to send the lift back down when you've got up to the top penthouse suite send the lift back down for others and that that whole thing of paying it forward to two other people without expectation of anything by, in return by the way, and if you really want to do it take the lift back down and pull them by the hand and bring them up i like that even better i like that even better yeah that's very good and and that is where i think your book really resonated for me when you talked about the tough upbringing that your parents had as they came from europe with so little and yet here you are helping so many others. And what's your top tip about, you just talked about emotional intelligence, you've covered that beautifully, but the next one is cultural intelligence, you know, diversity, equality, and inclusion. What's your, your wisdom and experience about including others who are different from you, from different backgrounds and all sorts? What's, what's your top wisdom there? So, you know, when, I think when people get to understand and see that you're not necessarily on opposite sides of the table from them when they can when they can see that and that comes from vulnerability you know that comes from dropping your judgments and truly wishing to understand you know there's there's so many times where you can be in a position to try to understand 
and drop your guard and drop your expectations and, and just be vulnerable. And what you really want to do is more metaphorically, instead of on the opposite end of the table, kind of be on the same side of the table and looking at it together. Now you might see it differently. You might have different likes, you know, you, you, someone might like pistachio, somebody might like strawberry, but you could both see it as ice cream. And there's some good things about ice cream that could come. And there's also some bad things about ice cream that can happen, right? So, but look at it together. Don't look at it argumentatively and don't like, you know, like the addition, the, the, the debate over abortion. I think anyone who is really strong-minded on either side should rethink that because you should be able to say, this is what I believe, but you know what? I can understand why you feel the way you do. You know, whether you're pro or, 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 or against whatever it is, I can respect the point of view. And this is the way most of life is. Life is not where it's, you know, okay, mathematics, it's definitive. Okay. Pretty much, you know, one-on-one is two and that's it. Don't tell me it's different than that. Okay. But our views and our feelings and the way we see things, they're not so clear cut. And the ability to see someone else's side of it is really important. You know, there's a great story about Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev as they met and were trying to end the Cold War. They were on opposite ends of the table and it was getting heated. So Ronald Reagan, he's my favorite US president. I found him so inspiring. Gets up and leaves the meeting comes right back in, extends his hand and says, hi, I'm Ronald, let's start over, but let's go for a walk together. And so here you have the two leaders of the world walking together, looking in the same direction, not opposing each other and trying to see things together. That was the beginning of the end of the Cold War. And if they could do that, let's think about what you could do with the person you love most in life. If you start trying to look at it together, if they can see that you're, appreciating their perspective, although you could have a difference, but you can understand why they feel the way they do. Yeah. Oh, so but, true. So true. And I guess you love humor. Let me see if I can remember one of Ronald Reagan's humorous one that he said to Gorbachev. And he said, um, he said, uh, you know, and salesmen, you love sales. So anyway, he said uh, there was a salesman in a Trabant shop in Moscow. And this chap came in, he wanted to buy one of the Trabants. He said, I'd like, I'd like one of those models. And he said, uh, yes, sir, that's no problem. We can deliver it to you. He said, how long before it could be delivered? He said, um, 10 years. 10 years? He said, um, he said, is that in the morning or the afternoon? And the guy said, oh, it's 10 years from now. Why are you asking in the morning or the afternoon? He said, well, well I've got the plumber coming in the morning. <laughs> And of course, it made the two of them laugh. And, and, and that's what got connections. Just like I think Margaret Thatcher and, and Gorbachev got on very well as well. And, and with Ronald Reagan, it was the, the three of them amazing people. Um, from that to resilience, from humor to resilience, um, you've got amazing stories of resilience and picking yourself up and learning and the optimism when you were a kid and you didn't have much to play with, but, but you found things to play with if you didn't, you know, discarded toys from other kids. But, but you picked yourself back up, you kept uh, optimistic. What would be a, a tip that you'd give people from your experience of resilience against adversity? So Jonathan, you know, um, one of the great honors that I received was my employees bought me a plaque that said that exact word on it, resilience. Uh, actually, was resilience C is what the plaque said. And they felt that uh, one of the things that I did well was embodied resiliency. And there's a lot that goes into that, but it could be one of the most important qualities we have, because as I said, we're all going to suffer. We're all going to have hard knocks. We're all going to have outcomes that we don't want. And our choice is to dwell on that, to, you know, oh, what was me to be sorry, whatever it is, or give ourselves a little time to absorb the setback. Okay. You're not going to be, you know, so you absorb that, but now, what will get you out of it better than anything is a plan to move forward or in a different direction or to adapt. That's what we'll do. And optimism, optimism is key. Know that you can count on yourself, that you have the ability, you have the ability to gain resources. You have a way to persevere, knowing that you can do it. 
And it's little things at first, but you should almost welcome these setbacks because as you persevere through them, it gives you confidence to know that you can continue to do that. And you should also understand that some of these setbacks, some of them, not all of them, certainly, but some of them, and in fact, most of them are blessings that lead you to a better place. You just mentioned one on this call. You said something very interesting, Jonathan. You said that there was a lot of pain in that divorce that you went through. And it was probably something you didn't want to go through and it was probably horrible. And so many people can relate to that. But then what also so many people can relate to is what you said afterwards. If you didn't go through that, you would have not been able to find your current relationship. What you said was your soulmate. And you also said how very happy you are. If you didn't go through that pain, you would have not discovered that happiness. So whether it's a job, career, opportunity, investment, health choice that you've made, if you didn't go through the pain and that bad part, if you didn't show the resiliency that you have, and so many people listening don't even realize how much resiliency that they have, then they would not be in that spot they are now. I bet you so many people are in a job that they really like but they hated losing that previous job. They hated getting fired. They hated to get their job terminated. They hated to relocate, whatever it was that caused them that sadness, that pain that they went through. It might've made the pain a little bit less if they counted on and believed and were optimistic to say, okay, this is gonna lead to something better. And now I'm gonna start planning for how I'm gonna to get to something better. Yeah, uh, very, very profound. Thank you. And. Um, I was thinking about the next from from the resilience to, to brand and reputation is the next one, which is um, what people say about you when you're not in the room, you know, your um, your reputation. And uh, some people say, I'm, I'm not worried what people think about me. I'm just going to do my own thing. And I mean, a lovely uh, there's a lovely quote from somebody which said, you know, if you worry what people think about, you'd be surprised how little they do. <laughs> They're thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about you. But if in the leaders who are listening to this, they do need as a CEO or an MD or any kind of leadership role. They do need support. to be aware. They need to you be need aware. Support. Yes, you need support. Yeah. You need loyalty. You need support. You need people to believe in you. And, that, and that's why what you have to do as a leader, a leader of a household, leader of a business, whatever it is, if you're a leader, what you have to do is you have to be a good communicator. And, you know, communication is really when you break it down, what is it? It's an idea I have in my brain and putting it in your brain. So there's been a path on how to get to that formulation of the idea. So if I just try and insert the end result to you without the benefit of the pathway, it becomes a breakdown in communication more often than not, because they don't understand, well, why are you thinking that they're just, you're, you're, you're crazy. Cause that's not what the way I see it. But if you can give them the reader's digest version, as to what caused you to formulate that as part of your explanation, you'll be a much better communicator. And that's key in getting that support. The other thing is, is that when you're, when you're trying to obtain this support from others is you also have to try and see it as they see it, you know, and, and making sure that what you're trying to do is not just in your best interest, but in everyone's best interest and, and show them that. So, so being a leader, and trying to do something and saying, well, I don't care what others think about. I don't, I don't aspire to that. You know, now I don't aspire to sacrificing principles in order to make people adore me and get likes on Facebook. That's not what I'm looking to do either. So there's, we talked about it earlier. We talked about not breaking promises, doing the right things. If you have that as your compass and you, and, and you really are looking to do something that is good, even if it's less popular, if you're looking to do something that's good, there will be a lot of consensus and a lot of support you have because what you really want to try and do is have people see that vision and believe in that vision. So you have to communicate it well. You have to show people why it helps them. Why is it in their best interest? It's okay if it's in your best interest too. Mm -hmm. So you know, But show them why. Don't sell them why. Show them why. Explain to them why this is a good thing. This will, this will either do good for others, do good for them, you know, if they see that you have a good moral compass, um, people will get behind that. Mm, it's so true. Uh, and the final element before we go into executive team's book and then your top tip is legacy. 
the last piece of what we find makes inspiring men and women leaders. Now, you've already got a legacy. You've got four children. You've got two grandchildren. You've touched the lives of many thousands of people. Um, but what would you like your legacy to be, both business-wise and uh, from a personal family point of view? Well, I, I certainly want to try and set a good example and, and try and help others. You know, that's I, I do want to do good in the world. I want to try and help and inspire people to to also want to be good leaders and and do good in the world. I, I that makes me very happy and proud when I feel that I've made a difference for others. And I'd like others to discover how amazing the feeling of fulfillment you get when you do help others. You know, I'd like people to be less less begrudging with kindness. So my legacy, I would hope that people would view me as being someone who's very kind and uh, very caring, but also wanting to bring out the best in others. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, you're you a good example for, for my, my, my children and those who are close to me. Be yeah. a good example for them. Yeah, it, it, by all accounts, you clearly have done. And I've been very touched by your book and what, what others like uh, Brian have said. And also in business, you've, you've been in many teams, you've set up teams, you've run so many different businesses, successful teams. But I wonder if you've ever had sort of toxicity in any of the teams that you've inherited when you started with them and somebody was a bit toxic and made the team not perform at its best. What's your tip for, for turning a team around when it's gone toxic or when there's somebody in it who's toxic? What, what have you done to turn it around? Well, you know, I, I've been very blessed because I've tried to put the teams together, but sometimes you find that you made a mistake there. Um, I, I had one just recently that um, was a hire, um, was a woman that very early on I had concerns about. And um, the first step was to have a discussion and then to see the response. And, you know, always trying to be someone that fixes things it's just kind of in my dna you know there was a more stern discussion and then watching the response to that and the response was one that you know that individual's nature just wasn't i could tell wasn't going to have them make the turn because they were unwilling to accept that they could be wrong unwilling to apologize unwilling to accept an own responsibility and at that point in time, we had no alternative but to terminate. So you cannot afford to have the wrong people on your team. You can't afford that. Now, that person might be the right person on a different team, mm. but not on our team and not what we're looking for because we're, um, we're looking to be happy. Look, I have a pretty simple business philosophy. It's really, really simple. I spoil my employees and I spoil my customers. <laughs> and that's, that's our philosophy. That's it. Mm. We have no turnover. We have really, really, really happy employees. And I'm not going to allow something to upset that. And our customers have come to know that you know, we're going to cater to them and make them very, very happy and do everything we can. And we're always going to deliver more than what you bargained for. We're not going to nickel and dime you. We're not going to say, look, who doesn't like to be taken care of? So, okay, here's the deal we made. Here's what we've agreed to. This was the bargain and sale. But now what we're going to do is with no obligation to do so, we're going to give you more. We're going to do more. And that builds a reputation for someone you could trust, someone you could believe in. That also enacts the law of reciprocity where they're going to want to do great things for you even though if you're not asking. And you each think about relationships in life. Well, like, Life's about relationships mm. and having that as just the foundation of just the way I do things. I have the most wonderful relationships with people where I can almost go almost anywhere and be treated special and be treated kindly and not as a customer, but as a friend. And they know when they work with me, that's the way that they get. That's what people want. This is what we want. So why not just do what everybody wants? Just, just this is you're, you're tapping into a deep desire that people have just to want to be treated great, to want to be acknowledged, to want to be treated special. I want that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, you don't build a relationship by asking. You build a relationship by offering. You start mm -hmm. by giving. You start by understanding. 
and then people reciprocate. It's just, it's the most wonderful thing. If you want to be happy and have everybody you meet with or go to be treating you great, you will be mm. happier, I promise. Yeah, no, thanks, Barry. Well, uh, now the uh, penultimate uh, discussion point is books. Clearly, there's your own book about seizing opportunities, money in the streets, which um, I have thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, would there be another book that you've read recently uh, that you have found has given you some good leadership lessons or you've taken something from it? Could be an autobiography or anything like that. What, what would you say is a book that you'd recommend you know, people read? We mentioned Reagan. I, I, I read Reagan's book recently. That's the most recent one. It was a long one, but I, but I just, you know, his, his biography was, was, was great. Um, but, you know, I find that most of my reading, because of what I do, I, I read all the time, I'm, I devour stuff, but it has to be more like event driven and understanding and, and you know, has to be more current, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I try to um, consume, you know, those bigger lessons um, to the best of my ability, but most of my reading is, is understanding um, market data. I just read Ivy Zellman's book, you know, Give Me Shelter right before the Reagan book. So uh, those are the two that I, I read most recently. And, and that was an excellent book too. I'll give Ivy uh, um, a, a, a great review on her book. So, you know, these are inspiring stories and, and, I, and I like to understand, you know, how, how individuals overcome adversity mm. um, and, and turn that adversity into a positive. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. Well, look, Barry, it's been fantastic. Stay on the line. We're going to do your final two minute top tip and then uh, we'll chat after we've finished recording. But would you just introduce yourself again for this last standalone two minute top tip on your favorite leadership tip? Hi, Barry Habib. I'm the author of Money in the Streets, also a professional speaker for many years, the CEO of MBS Highway. I've done quite a bit of acting and the producer of Rock of Ages which was the 27th longest running show on Broadway. It's also worldwide. Uh, in addition to that, produced Chris Angel in Las Vegas and Whitney Houston. So my top tip here, and it's very hard to just give one tip, is kindness and vulnerability. You know, really try to be empathetic and understanding and kind because all of us are going through struggles and look for the good in others. And, that, that means that you have to get over your own insecurities and, and be vulnerable. And, and, and everyone has a different view. Try to understand why they feel that way. Uh, also, everybody is, can be looked at as a, as a book. You can learn someone, learn something from everyone. Maybe take a page out of each person's book. It'll make your book a lot richer. Barry, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to have you on the Inspiring Leadership Series. Uh, and I wish Jonathan, you every success. As, as I do you, Jonathan. What a, what a privilege to be on with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barry.